Good morning, everyone. Whether you're here or in Traditions or in Ording Valley or online, just grab your handout and open it for a moment. Before I do that, I, I want to ask you uh, something. Would you join me next week? Next week will be one of the most significant weeks in the life of this church in the past 20 years. Uh, I'm going to share with you from my heart some things in the message on Sunday morning. And then at 4 o'clock, we're going to have our, ce- our family celebration. We're going to talk to you about what God has done with the past in the past. We're going to, we're going to be accountable for what you've, you've given us. Last year, you provided more than $2.2 million worth of resources. And we want to re- account to you what we did with that. God's helped us. I'm going to talk to you about the future of this church. I'm going to talk to you about my personal future. We're going to talk about what life is going to be as we move into the great future God has for us. And if you're a member, I want you there. In fact, I I demand that you be there. If you're not a member and this is your church home, I want you to be there as well. Because we really, together, do God's will and purpose in this community. So put it on your calendar. Sunday morning, 9.30 or 11. And then 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, it's too late. 4 o'clock? We, we put it at 4 o'clock so the seniors can still be driving in the light when we get done. It's, it, it's not going to take a long time. But we just want everyone to be there. So if you'll do that for me, I would really appreciate it. This morning we finish up a series entitled Rooted. And it's, we're going to talk about being rooted in worship. And, Roots are essential because they allow for growth and they allow for stability and they allow for fruit to blossom. Our text for this entire uh, series has been Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thanksgiving. I just believe that 2020 is going to be a year of great growth for us. We're going to go deeper in the Word as as we read together and as we learn together. We're going to go deeper, connected in community as we are part of small groups and all the other things that we do together. We're going to have an attitude of gratitude. We're going to have an attitude of worship, and we're going to live generously. This, This rootedness into Christ Jesus will affect every part of our life. And I'm so excited about our future. But this morning we're going to focus on worship. And I want us to be very clear about what worship is. Worship, number one, is an expression of thankfulness. It's an expression of thankfulness. From a heart full of gratitude, it overflows. This morning, about 7.30, I I had come into the office. And and I'm one of those kind of guys that need coffee in the morning. And I need coffee at noon. And I need coffee at night. And, and so, so I'm, I'm making a pot of coffee. Now, I can't wait for the pot to fill. We've got this automatic coffee machine, and I've got my cup underneath, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill it, and then I'm going to move the, the, the big one over. And it's all, but Jeanette comes in and starts talking to me. And all of a sudden, I lose all track of what I'm doing. And she pays no attention either. And then I look back, and my cup is full, and there is coffee all over the counter. What happens when you are overflowing? It goes everywhere. It just, it just naturally flows out. Well, that's what worship is. It's a natural expression of the gratitude of our heart, and it goes out in every direction. It goes everywhere. And worship is an all-encompassing thing. It is not one thing or another. It is all of the above. True worship is more than a song or word. It is a life of active obedience. It's a life of active obedience. It's more than lip service. It's life service. Because our action speaks louder than words. You know, one of the things I've heard over the years from, about Sound Life Church, people come and, and they, they say, Pastor, we love the worship. And I know what, for most of them, them, what that means. It means they like the music. And, and we have phenomenal music at this church and trained music and skilled musicians. And we are blessed by our musicians. But that's not the entire scope of worship. It's, it's part of it, but it's not really the full substance. When I go to Starbucks, I usually order a mocha. 
I, I'm a mocha kind of guy. And they always ask me, you want whip on that? Of course! Of course, it's not a mocha without whipped cream on it. But the whipped cream is not the substance. It's great. It's part of it. But it's not the full substance. And in some ways, our musical worship is kind of like the whipped cream. It's wonderful. It tastes wonderful. It, it, it is sweet. It's, it's phenomenal. But you can't live on whipped cream. You know, I hear people going, wow, have you been in the Word this week? No, I've been listening to worship tapes. You know, if you open your fridge and all you see is cans of aerosol whipped cream, you're not going to be very healthy. Now, I, I won't ask you to raise your hand in a minute. How many of you have taken one of those cans and just gone, ah? It's one of the great joys in life. You tell your kids, no, you can't do that. And then once they leave, you go, okay. But that won't sustain you. You need it all. You need the protein. You need the vegetables. You need the, the, the minerals. You need it all. I love the worship at Sound Life Church. But when I say that, you know what that means? I love the serving. I love the giving. I love the volunteers. I love the passion and vision for the world. I love everything we do to actively serve God with every aspect of our life. Oh, I love the music as well. But that's just the whipped cream on top of the substance. And in Romans, we are going to look at what it means to worship. We're going to talk about a living sacrifice of worship. And our text will be Romans 12, verses 1 through 18. Because a living sacrifice means we give something of great value in response because we are thankful for all that God has done. And a sacrifice implies that it costs us something. There is value to us that we must release. Let's look at what Paul says to us in Romans. First of all, authentic worship engages us completely. Verses 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So, how does he define worship? To be a living, not a dead, but a living sacrifice. Meaning, we engage everything that's in us. We engage all that we are. We give him every part of ourselves. And holy, that means we are set apart. We don't give him the stuff that, that isn't good. You know, in some of your houses, there's a five-second rule. You know what that means? Something falls on the floor, and if you pick it up, you can eat it within five seconds. God doesn't have a five-second rule. He wants you to be holy. Oh, God, I only did that a little, but I'll pick it and give it to you as a sacrifice. No, we are holy. It's a total commitment. It, we give him the premium of our life, not the leftovers of our life. How often do we try to give God the stuff that doesn't matter to us? We give him the pieces of our time that don't count. We give him the, the money we have left over. And, and we have to justify that because too often we don't have any leftover. When we, it ought to be the first we don't give him our time. We don't give him our effort. We don't give him our love. We don't give him our devotion. We don't give him the engagement in the word. We don't do what we should. We give him bits and pieces. But true worship engages all of what we are. A total commitment. A sacrifice that costs you something. Because it changes our perspective and shapes our purpose. When we truly worship, we see things differently. We see eyes. We see through eyes of gratitude. And we, we see things in a way that, that we have never seen them before. 
and we begin to know what we were made to do. We, we are transformed. We, are, we think new thoughts. We live new ways. We have new goals. We have new vision. We do things with our life that we never dreamed possible because we have given ourselves as a living sacrifice. We are changed, not just peripherally, but fundamentally we are new creations in Christ Jesus. The old has passed and the new has come. And our potential for making a difference in this world is exponential. We have more that we can do than we ever dreamed possible when we give it to God in worship. And you know what's so wonderful? You can give it all to God in worship and he gives back to you. You have not lost what you have given. You have gained what you have given. It changes our perspective. And worship gives us an accurate view of who we are. Verses 3 to 5. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. I like that one. <laughs> Tone it down a notch. You ain't all that. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. And just, our, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. You are not the most important part of the body of Christ. I am not the most important body of the Christ. We are all part and important to the body of Christ. And when we have the right perspective, when we, when we see ourselves as we really are, we have a bigger view of who Jesus is. When I see myself within the, within the confines of what I really am, the need I have for him the, and the lack of, of, of total resource that I, that I need him so much, I see things entirely differently. It makes him bigger and me smaller. As, as John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease. Too many of us have an overblown view of ourselves. We think we're all that. But we aren't. Our honest evaluation is not just knowing our ability, but engages faith. It's a true measure. Now, honest evaluation. Some people have a too big a view of themselves. Some people have too small a view of themselves. Honesty says, this is who I am. And this is what I can do or can't do. But ultimately, when we do this well and we do it right, and when we worship with everything we are, faith is engaged in the process. And what God can do through faith, through our trusting him, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Have you ever hoped for God to do something through you? Have you ever hoped for God to use you greatly? Have you ever hoped to see something happen and God used you to see it happen? That's what faith engages. It makes us greater than we are. When we talk about missions, each of us does our part, but the sum of the parts is the whole is greater than those. We do great things for God together. Last year, priority one sent $3.5 million around the world to build Bible schools. We were part of that. We gave $40,000. We gave to build two dormitories in Burkina Faso for Bible school students. And we did the best that we could, and, and we believed God. But you know what? God did greater things than we could imagine. Let me tell you a little secret. This past year, Priority One received a gift of a half a million dollars from Hobby Lobby. We weren't expecting it. But the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. When God gets engaged, things happen. Okay? And keep shopping at Hobby Lobby. 
God does things through us and, and with us. And when we all engage and do what we can do, God does far more than we could ever ask or imagine. Because we are part of a greater whole. This thing is bigger than I am. This thing is bigger than you are. And together, we create the body of Christ. And our worship is to serve him as a living sacrifice, acceptable and holy to him. That's what worship is. Because faithful service is an act of worship. Faithful service is an act of worship. Verses 6, six through 8. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. I, I want you to notice that sarcasm, sarcasm is not one of the gifts given the church. <laughs> Encouragement is. Brian Jenkins, my son-in-law, has a southern mother, a gal from deep Arkansas. And she tells Brian, and this has been the code of her life to him, be sweet. Brian, be sweet. And sometimes he is. <laughs> no, most of the time he is. But that's what this is. Encouraging. Be sweet. Don't be sour. If it is giving, give generously. Now, everybody's called to give. Some have a gift of giving that is over and above. And if God has given you that gift or if God is trying to use you in that area, do it. And do it generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. If you're a leader and God has equipped you to lead, Lead as God gives you the opportunity, but take it seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Be kind. He gives us the gifts, and all of us have them. There is nobody in this room this morning. There is nobody in the sound of my voice this morning that doesn't have some gift God hasn't given. God's entrusted you something. Use it. Use it for his glory. And we use it for the benefit of the body. It's not for us. But it's for the body. And as we act out our worship through obedient service, the body is built. Discover your gifting and exercise it to the best of your ability. Find out what you can do. You say, Pastor, well, how do you do that? You, you try some stuff. You, you, you take a chance. You engage in some way. And then somewhere along the line, you'll find your fit. And then do that well. And don't just be satisfied just doing that. Maybe God has two or three things he wants you to do. You know, I, 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 I've gone on that journey. I remember as an 18-year-old kid feeling a call of God in my life. And, and I didn't know what that meant. For the most part, I thought it meant to be a youth pastor. Well, in college, uh, I, I, I went on a public relations team and, and I, I sang. That wasn't my gifting. <laughs> I got hired as a youth pastor. And after two years, I figured out that wasn't my gifting. I, I had some ability, but it wasn't my true gifting. I became an evangelist for two years, preaching close to 250 times a year. I, I really loved it. It was my master's degree in communication. But that wasn't my gifting. I, <laughs> I was the district youth director. I, I led all of youth ministries for the 350 churches of the Assemblies of God in the state of Washington, northern Idaho. I took over 600 kids overseas, in missions trips, over a five-year period. And I loved every second of it. But at the end of five years, I knew that wasn't what my life's work would be. That wasn't my total gift. Tina and I planted a church in Kirkland 
spent eight years doing that. Church planting is not my gift. And 21 years ago, God brought us here to lead you. And from the moment I walked on the stage, the first time in this church, which was over there at that time, I knew this is where I fit. And to the best of my ability, I have tried to be faithful with everything I've had for the past 25 years, 21 years, to lead well, to serve well, to worship with my life. I didn't know that my fit would be Sound Life Church in Spanaway, Washington. I thought it would be all kinds of other places. But when I found my fit, haha, <laughs> it was perfect. That's what God wants to do for you. You got to try a few things, make yourself available, and God will make Himself known to you. And then, love the right things. And what are the right things? People and righteousness. Verse 9 and 10. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Oh, I like that. You know, the, the lobby of our, of our church can be one of the most hypocritical areas in the state of Washington on Sunday mornings. How you doing? Great. How are you? Oh, I just love you guys. And then you go out and skewer them in the parking lot. Really love them. Love people. Just don't say you do. Really love them. And then hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. There's an old saying, and it's absolutely true. God loves people more than anything. And you should too. You should love people more than your things. You should love people more than your job. You should love people more than your career. You should love people as God loves people. Love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then your neighbor as yourself. And God loves righteousness because it reflects his character. When we love righteousness, we are loving what God is. He is righteous. We love what is right. We hate what is wrong. We pattern our life to what he loves, and we shaped our life to what he is. Character. That's what we love. And ultimately, worship is an attitude. 11 and through 13. Never be lazy. Never be lazy. But work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. <laughs> Have the right attitude. When you serve God, when you serve God, You say, well, you know, my service is worship. If you got a bad attitude, it, it, the whipped cream has soured. Okay? Just because you're doing the job doesn't mean you're doing it with the right heart. Do the right thing with the right heart. Serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. And always be eager to practice hospitality. How long has it been since you invited somebody into your house? Something we don't often do. We cocoon. We screen our calls. We text instead of talk. We try to control the environments because we don't want real relationships. We want to make sure that our life looks like our Instagram post. No. Open your life to people. Open your heart to people. Be authentic with everything you are. Worship. 
Worship is a mindset. It's not just an activity. It's offering God everything you are. It's, it's a perspective that keeps God at the center and trusts him and is grateful for everything he's done. You are grateful for your health. You are grateful for your place to live. You are grateful that you live in this nation. You are grateful for the freedoms you have. You are grateful for your family. You are grateful for everything you have. And out of that attitude of gratitude, worship overflows everywhere. And if we do that, we live generously. Live generously. Open-handed. You, you say, well, Pastor, you keep talking about money. I'm not talking about money right here. I'm talking about living with a generous life. Generous with your time. Generous with your love. Generous with your compassion. How long has it been since you just sat and were with somebody who was hurting? You were willing to take the time to pray with them and, and, to, and to cry with them. Also, be generous with your resources. Because everything you have comes from God. You want the resources to keep flowing? Be generous with them. Use them the way God asks you to use them. You know, one of the reasons why we are accountable to you for the way we use the resources you've entrusted to us is because we are accountable to God. Yeah, we're accountable to you, but I'm a whole lot more worried about God than I am you. Because he is the one that blessed you. And out of your generous life, you gave resources. And for some of you, it was sacrificial. We want to honor that. And we want to do the best that we can with it. We are all called to live generously. Open-handed. I, I, like, I like that illustration. That we live open-handed. Because oftentimes we are closed up. We think somebody's trying to get something over on us. Our first reaction is we don't trust. You say, well, what if somebody misuses that trust? That's their problem. God's going to even the books. If you live open-handedly, you're not going to believe that at, at, at first blush that somebody's trying to get something over on you. You're going to trust them. Well, how do I know they can be trusted? You'll find out. And if you trust God, he'll leave in the books. Live generously. And then worship binds us together in unity. Verses 14 through 16. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. I don't like that. I want, you know, as David said, I want you to break their teeth, God. <laughs> but pray for them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Be happy with the people who are rejoicing. Don't, don't feel bad because you don't feel the same way. And weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. <laughs> you know what I like about that is we're all ordinary. <laughs> and I like the last line. Don't think you know it all. <laughs> Paul just kind of gets right to the point. Hey, dudes. Don't think you know it all. As the body of Christ, we are of one mind, of one heart. We are reliant on God. And we obey as worship. And we love everybody. And we become teachable. You don't know it all. There are things to... I'm still learning things.
This next month, I have to finish my master's thesis, and I am sweating bullets. And I've done interviews with pastors who have, who have uh, transitioned. That's, that's what my, my master's thesis is about. And, uh, and one of my friends I was interviewing who about three years ago transitioned from being lead pastor to being a staff member. And, and, uh, and he said, you know, Cal, what I learned is that after being a le- lead pastor, I have to learn how to be a Christian. I got to live out what I've preached for 30 years. And not from the pulpit, but from the pew. He said, I, I had a lot to learn. Don't think you know it all. No matter how old you are, you're still learning things. You still have much to learn. And then worship results in peace. 17 and 18. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everybody can see you are honorable. Do all that. You can live in peace with everyone. One of the great goals of life is to be at peace. And when we worship and we live the way God wants us to, and we are living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, we have the right attitude and the right perspective, and we get the right results, which is peace in our relationships with God and fellow man. Because we know what's really important. Oh yeah, it's wonderful. To worship God with music. To be caught up in the emotion of the presence of God. As the songs of worship are sung. As as we lift his name in praise. Is a wonderful thing. And it is is a... It is a fabulous opportunity to tell God how we feel about him. But ultimately, our worship is found in the nitty-gritty of obedience. Worship that is holy, meaning set apart, means that that worship comes from a life that has been dedicated to him. So, worship is rooted in thankfulness expressed in obedience. As someone once said, it doesn't matter how high you jump at the worship service. What really matters is how straight you walk when you walk out of there. What you do when the music's playing is only a small part of what worship really is. It's more than what we say. It's what we do. Lord, thank you for your word. Allow it to dig deep into our hearts and lives. And may we worship you with all that we are. And may our worship be holy and acceptable. May it be a living sacrifice. It honors you with everything we are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.